um, the next album that you're going to help me with, you actually might you might say, actually, you are a composer. You are an orchestrator because the next album is full of or- orchestral music. All right, okay. okay. Um, um, but you might hear it and be like, no, you're still not an orchestra. I, I, you're faking it well. <laughs> you know? But it's there's a there's at least I can't remember exactly how many songs. These are again most of these songs on this next one are recorded in 2022 and a little bit in 2023. Um, like because they were the songs I started writing when I first moved here. Is this the Nova Scotia songs album? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, mm. yeah. So it's got like a the one of the first songs I wrote was called the Malignant Suite, and. <laughs> right. uh, I think it's amazing that you live in a place called Malignant, Malignant Cove. It's like such a strange, strange place name. You, you can't imagine the person who named it liked it very much. It is. And the, and the neat thing about it is like it shows you how names change when people reflect on the area. Because whenever I, I, I don't like when people ask me, like, where do you live? When I meet someone in town, I, I'm, I always hesitate to say Malignant Cove. Because as soon as you say Malignant Cove, they look at you like, oh, you have Malignant Cove money. You know, like because it's, oh, right. it's, you know. Because Nova Scotia is is like one of the most poverty poverty stricken parts of Canada, right? And, oh, right. Uh, and so, um, and there's a huge divide between the middle class and lower class. You know, there's there's a little bit upper class. Actually, I'm going to be at upper class house today. I'm going to a, a house that probably cost ten million dollars to build. I'm going to do some work at this guy's house. Ooh. But um, he's one of the richest guys in town, if not the richest guy in town. Uh, he owns an insurance company. Um, but um, um. But when you people live in Malignant Cove are usually the, the wealthier people in town. But most people don't live with three families. You know, like the only reason we can afford to live in Malignant Cove is because we sold three houses and I live with my parents and my brother and my, you know, mm. so we all threw in on this place. Right. So I have to always explain that to people like, oh, you live in Malignant Cove. And, and because it's a small community, people go like, oh, you're the ones that bought the Hicks residence because they know the people that used to live here, the Hicks, you know, uh, Ed and Dorothy Hicks. And they... Uh, you know, so they immediately like turn their fucking noses up at me, like, "Oh, you can afford to live there. You you have oceanfront, do you? How many acres is that? You know, how big is the house? You know?" And I'm just like, "Fuck off!" You know, like, you owe me a hundred dollars for fixing your dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they they suddenly think they don't need to pay you because of where you live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So it's a uh, it's it's a strange one, but I know that news flies fast. So within within a year or two, people will stop looking at me like, "Oh, you're the guy that lives in Malignant Cove." You know, that comes around taking everybody's money. If you say that you lived with your parents in Malignant Cove, that has puts a completely different spin on it, doesn't it? Well, I, I have to be, I, to me, I have to say more because that sounds like I'm a moocher. Like I, my parents have a lot of money, <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just taking advantage of them, you know? Yeah. I guess so, it doesn't make it any better in the long run, I suppose. No, so I have to tell them the whole thing. Like, you know, I tell, I usually, because if I'm in the fix an appliance, if I'm not, like if I'm in the middle of doing something, I have time to tell the story about how we moved out here and... Mm. Because originally it was just going to be me and my wife. We we're going to we wanted to move out of town, you know. COVID made me hate society, so I wanted to live someplace where there was less people. Right, right. And we were looking we we're looking at northern Ontario or the East Coast because those are the two places we could afford to live and buy a chunk of land. And and essentially, you know, if if they decide one day I'm not allowed to buy groceries or I'm not allowed to get health care or I'm not allowed to come to town, I can still survive. And that's what I, that was basically my need, right? And this property is one of those places. It's not big enough to go hunting and whatnot, but there's enough open land around where I could. Plus, you've got all those lobsters. Exactly, lobsters, and and in the winter we got seals, right? And <sighs> juicy. You know, I'm looking, f- I'm looking forward to the first bald eagle I eat. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Oh no! Oh but, God! <laughs> I probably won't ever eat a bald eagle, but I mean. If it's Thanksgiving, but you would, and you would if collapse. you could, wouldn't you? You would, you would definitely. Oh, yeah, I would eat it like a turkey. I would yeah. pluck it, and I would. It'd be <laughs> delicious. You're a man who's eaten a a, a, re- a recently deceased octopus, so you know you'll eat anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, of course. You know, if when push comes to shove, I'll eat the neighbors. You know. I mean, okay. <laughs> oh, I couldn't eat my neighbors. They're too nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, that's, I, 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 I'm talking pushing and shoving, right? Not just like, hey, I'm hungry. How about the neighbor? I'm, I'm, I'm talking. I'm talking like, you know, there's there's smoke in this on the horizon, and you can hear tanks rolling down the road, and everybody's hiding in in their basements, and the neighbors come over with a with a 22 looking for my canned goods. Well, that neighbor's getting eaten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> but uh, you know, I'm just I'm just planning for the worst of it. But um. You know, so then eventually it just morphed into like not just me moving away with my wife to me and my brother and his wife doing this together and then and then my parents not wanting to be away from their kids and their future grandchildren. So um yeah, it became a family affair. 
you know, and that's why we, we ended up in this house because this house would never be on the this house and property never would have been on on the uh, the agenda if if it wasn't for all of us mm. doing it together. Mm-hmm. But um, so yeah, so I tell them that story. Not as much about eating the neighbors and the uh, and eating bald eagles, <laughs> but but <laughs> yeah, I tell leave, them about go leave that bit out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I tell them the circumstances that led to it, and then and then immediately we're not. It's, they look at it more like we own a little apartment building on the ocean rather than, than yeah. we're, we're, we're rich living on a, the mansion on the hill kind of thing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's not a mansion, but it's a nice big house and it's, and it's uh, you know, not big enough for all of us, but it's big enough. I mean, physically, we can have room for all of our stuff. It's just, you know, we, you know, it's, it can be tense some days, you know? Yeah, I'm sure. You know, of course, I've, you know. I've, I've, ta- I've, ta- I've talked to you about it a few yeah. times. I've vented, yeah. vented my frustrations here and there when I'm having a bad day. I had a friend at work who was... Uh, a very tense guy, you know. And I was talking to him one day, and I said, "Well, oh, when do you when do you relax and just do your own thing?" He says, "Well, I can't." And I said, "Would you not have your own your own room or a study or something?" No. I said, "Well, where's your, where's all your stuff?" He says, <laughs> "He says at the end of the sofa." So that was all he had. He didn't have like, any space to go to, and I think that's important, you know. If you if you everybody needs a little space, it doesn't have to be very big. You know, but you do need a broom cupboard or something, some place that you can go and just do your stuff. You know, I think that's important. A lot of people miss that, I think, especially people that are not fortunate enough to have uh, enough money to get a space. Especially, I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate. We've got quite a nice house here, but um, a lot of the kids these days are just no. I don't know what, what they see in their future with regard to, you know, houses and things. The way the way that house prices are going I mean I guess it's not it's not hasn't been traditionally as bad in in North America I don't know how Canada fares re- with, with regard to that but I know in America they're beginning to they're beginning to get the same thing there that we had for, we've had here for a long time which is which was really instigated by Margaret Thatcher when she sold off all of the public housing stock all of the local authority housing but this is a this is an old local authority house that we live in, and um, she brought in the right to buy, which meant that people who were paying rent to the local authority, instead of doing that, uh, could buy their house, so they would get a mortgage. So all of the income that the local authorities had from their rents suddenly switched from them to the banks, where they just invented the money, and now we have that economy and I think America is suffering from that now as well where you hear about people who can't afford houses and all that kind of stuff you know but we've had that for a long long time it's just got worse here worse and worse to the point where some of the rural communities are in all sorts because there's nowhere for the kids to live the kids the kids grow up and they have to move because there's nowhere for them to live well that that's a, that doesn't sound like a candidate hater again but it's worse in Canada than the US much worse is it right yeah we're, yeah we've uh, um, you know like I the income like the, you up in Canada, the average salary is about half of what you make in the U.S., but we pay twice as many taxes on top of those small salaries, and um, and we've let the banks ruin the house housing thing, and foreign investors ruin housing. Like so, in Canada, someone from China can own ten houses and just rent them out. Yeah, we right. have that here so, too. Yeah, definitely. You know, and so, like right now, like just in Halifax, which is one of the out of the major cities in Canada, is the poorest of the major cities. Um, to rent a one bedroom apartment right now in Halifax is over $2,000 a month. Yeah. And, and this is for people who are making, you know, like $14 an hour, you know, working at Tim Hortons, you know, or some coffee joint. Mm-hmm. People are working two, two and three jobs. Some people who can't afford the rent. It has a terrible impact on family life as well, because people can't start, people can't start families until they're much older. No. Because you can't afford, you can't afford to have a kid. No, it's which is terrible. You know, uh, what, what, what the fuck are, are our politicians doing if they're just letting that sit there like that you know they, they are they're in the pockets of the banks and the big corporations that are making this happen you know and there's there are solutions there are great solutions and the UK had that solution after the Second World War where it, it you know the, the the horror of the two wars in close proximity to one another sort of pushed the British public as a whole into a, a kind of more um, it would be called a left-wing viewpoint, but it's a more it's a more egalitarian. We're all in it together. We should all we should all solve the problems together, kind of thing, rather than devil take the hindmost, which it was up to then. And the NHS was invented, and the idea of public housing came about. So it was the local author- your local authority would build the houses. You would rent rent them from them, and when your kid was old enough to have a house, they would rent also. 
And so there's no need to own property because you've got a place to live. You have all your stuff there. It's a life rent, so you're not going to get kicked out unless you do something really stupid. And it's a great economy because your 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 wealth that you earn is going to pay for the services that the local authority brings on your behalf and it gives them a constant cash flow that they can invest if they need to. Uh, if they do it wisely, it's okay. A lot of places don't do that, but some some do. And it's completely flipped over so that the local authority is now funded. Half of the funding comes from central government. So you're paying, that's why you have to pay extra taxes because the, the because the government wants to wants to keep up the illusion that money is real and so has to has to pay for in inverted commas the things that that the people want and it just it's a it's a dreadful economy it really is it's it's, it's horrendous because it gives it gives the power to the worst of the people it gives the power to the people who would just want to be rich yeah so if you just want to be rich get into banking and just invent all of the money and take your cut so well, it's all you're doing when you go for a loan they don't have that money they invent it yeah and you pay it back with interest and somewhere along the way they <laughs> some, somewhere along the way they can sell that interest that 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 ownership of that debt to somebody else which led of course to the the crash in 2008 when people were lending money all over the place to people who couldn't pay it back so yeah it's a fucked up system well it's i can see why you know um by if you like look deep into the bible and any other religious stuff except for maybe um the Jewish religion, I'm not sure or not, because I don't know about, enough about their religion, but it's immoral to, to lend money with interest. It's, well, it's certainly in um, in the Quran, it is. Absolutely it is. I mean, it's one of the things that they, they, that they adhere to to this day, I think. And yeah, there's a certain there's a certain amount of wisdom in all of those old books, for sure. Yeah, the moneylenders, you know, Jesus Jesus going and kicking over the moneylenders' tables. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, well, because it's, you know, I know the, the fallacy of money is so horrendous, it's, it's hurting us beyond comprehension um but you know back when money was represented with physical goods like like gold you know being able to collect interest ruins the balance every time it's it, it's it makes an equation that's unequitable you know and uh it's it's messed up you know and it's uh i learned that one time um because i we're, you and i are both born in a system where lending money and, and having interest on it just seems normal it's part of the it's part of the the whole si- si- system mm-hmm. But I was reading a book by Robert Heinlein one time. Um, I'm not sure. I know you and I are both readers, but I don't know how much Robert Heinlein you've read. I'm not sure. Are you a fan of his at all? Uh, I have read a little bit, but no, I wouldn't say I'm a fan. I don't. I don't. I don't think I've got any of his books through there in the in the wee library. Okay. Yeah. I there's a few I'd recommend, but there was one. Um, he started off. He got his first big break writing juvenile books. So not not children books, but books for like like teenage male. Ah, you know. Uh-huh. Um, and. Uh, his, his first book that was published was written for teenagers. Um, but his a book he wrote before that, that got published after he died finally, um, was called For Us the Living. And it was a, more of an adult uh, fiction. And it's a, it's a really neat book. It's about this guy who um, got frozen somehow. Like he was like a scientist that got frozen somewhere and they thought him out like thousands of years in the future. They found him and then he had to, he had to adapt to this new reality. And in this new reality, um, it's like a utopian society where people don't like money is not important. Like money still exists, but it's only exists as a trading token. Mm-hmm. And the government and the government gives everybody the money they need to, to live, like a com- enough money to feed yourself, live in a home, and have hobbies. And any money beyond that, you make because you decide you want to make money. Like it's you know if you but if you don't want to make money, you just want to be a dancer. You dance. If you want to be a songwriter, you write songs. Right. And, uh, and he's having a hard time wrapping his head around this. And so a big part of the book is this uh, conversation. They make him talk to an economist and they explain to him about how we came about the system, you know, and part of it was him explaining how the banking system was continuously ruining everything. And this book was written during the Great Depression, right? So he, it was Robert Heinlein's exam, uh, examination of what caused the depression back in the 20s or whatever it was. Wow. It was the 30s. I think it was the 30s. Was the, oh, 30s. Sorry. Yeah, 30s, yeah, 30s yeah. was the big depression, yeah. Yeah, so he so the book was written in like 1934 or something like that or whatever it was or 30, wow. 1936, and and he was talking about and in the and in the book there is like these little like um, uh, how do we call them like subtitles or like instructions like like little asterisks with a bunch of italicized words at the bottom of the page saying to understand what the comics is about to explain to you please do this and it encourages you to grab like a deck of cards or like a bunch of tokens or pennies or something like a bunch of things you could put out on the table. 
and it has and it has you basically create like three separate parts of the economy you know like businesses people and the banks and it has you move things around on the table and using interest as a movement and no matter how you move things at the end of your little experiment the bank has everything and everybody has nothing yeah you know and um and when i did that i was like oh my god like this is like why aren't people talking about this and i've i've talked to highly intelligent people about this and they get angry like they get it's like telling them the earth is flat of course like they're like what do you mean you, the banks are the one taking the risks what do you mean they don't get interest and i'm like what do you mean the banks are taking the risk what bank are you seeing risking anything you know they risk nothing you know we all of us take the risk like if i buy a house with a mortgage with an interest rate on it, if I can't pay it, the bank doesn't lose. I lose. I lose everything. I lose my ability to borrow more money. I lose the place where I live. I lose everything I own. I might lose my family, you know? And if they stress me out enough, I might kill myself. You know, I might lose my life over it. <laughs> yes. You know? There was a time when the system was a bit more equitable than it is now. I think, I don't know whether Heinlein covers this in the book. I wouldn't be surprised if he does because he was a clever chap. But what happens is that there's a feedback loop where the bank gets more and more as time goes on. Yeah. The bank and or people who are doing the same thing as the bank, like the people who are billionaires now, who are taking money, like the, the peop- like Google, for example, Apple, uh, Elon Musk personally, you know, all these kind of people there, they are, they're siphoning off their cut as the thing circles round. And as, the, as that happens, they get more, they get more and more capacity as time goes on. It's not, it's not that they have the same capacity uh, that they had 50 years ago, the capacity to absorb the their cut is bigger than it was because they've got many, many more apertures where that, that you know, like mouths biting, you have more of them, and so they get more and more as time goes on. So that where where there's where there's ec- an equitable arrangement, for example, where interest rates are at are, are to borrow interest rates are at 10 percent, and to invest interest rates are at 8 percent. Now that's equitable because okay, the banks are making money, yes, but they're only making that two percent. And so as it, as it goes round, they're making money, but that's okay because you're also making enough money because you're investing. But that's gone. Yeah. The, the it's only the mouths that are there now because ordinary people don't get anything from investing. Companies don't get anything from investing. It's only the banks that are getting anything. And those who are rich enough to have similar mechanisms, so it's 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 a fu- it's a fucked up system for sure, and it's il- it's delusional and illusory. And yes, when you confront people with it, they don't like it, and they 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 can't come back with anything. They just get angry. Yeah, I've had that a couple of times. Yeah, with, with people uh, like my dad, for example, he doesn't. He's like, you know, he's in his eighties now, but when he was younger, I used to say these kind of things, and he was. He, he, he's kind of looking at you as if to say, "Well, you're, you're mad. You're just mad. <laughs> of course, money's real." 